if you could mute yourselves in fact for now if that's okay yeah. sorry So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our workshop. Um, today we'll be discussing uh, online Canadian history modules and what teachers want. So online learning has never been more pertinent than right now, of course. So today we will discuss some examples of successful online teaching experiments. We'll get the opinion of our panelists on the challenges of connecting with learners via online courses, how best to keep students engaged via the web, and how it compares as an alternative to uh, in-person learning. So before we get to that, uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout the session using the live Q&A. And we'll pick one or two of these to discuss towards the end of our session. Uh, your input here is really valuable uh, to us and we're looking forward to reading your questions. So I'll introduce our panelists. So we have today, of course, uh, Jack Jedwell, the president of ACS. We have Rachel Collishaw, an experienced and award-winning secondary social studies teacher, uh, mm -hmm. who is also president of the Ontario History and Social Science Teachers Association and the newly formed Social Studies Educators Network of Canada. And we also have uh, Jean-Philippe Warren, professor of sociology and anthropology at uh, Concordia University. So uh, to get us started today, uh, Jean-Philippe is going to give us uh, a presentation. So. Jean-Philippe, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Chris. So I prepared as was uh, asked a 12 minute presentation, which uh, talked about an experiment in teaching Quebec society that Jack and I launched in 2015. So Jack convinced me to organize a course, to set up a course on Quebec society, which would be an in-class course in and interestingly enough, uh, we're you know the course is offered at Concordia University in, in Montreal, and this was a course that was not on the books. It was not part of the calendar in 2015. So nobody had thought about teaching a course focusing on Quebec society at Concordia University. The um, if I can go to the next slide, why is it not moving? uh just oh no all right so just sorry all right uh sorry about that all right so uh, basically we started with three key ideas the, so the first idea was we wanted the course to be organized in such a way as to give our students the proper training and knowledge they needed to live and work in Montreal. Now, many of these students were from Montreal, but they didn't have the basic notions, the basic understanding, you know, the, uh, the what was required for them to really understand the society in which they would be full citizens and, and, uh, and uh, be prepared to, uh, to face the challenges of working in Montreal. But also we had students coming from outside Quebec, Quebec, the province of Quebec, outside Canada. And of course, for them, it was really, really important after they graduate, if they wanted to stay in Montreal, live in Montreal and work in Montreal, to have at least some basic notions of what it means to be uh, working and living in this, in this city. So the, third, the second key idea was we wanted the course to be engaging. Uh, you know, Jack, you know that how important it is for someone, somebody like him to make sure that students not only participate, in, but also um, feel as if they, their, their uh, engagement, their, their, their um, experience is, is important and, and should be uh, um, at the heart of the pedagogical experience. Uh, and the third idea was a diversity of viewpoints. Jack and I have our own opinions, uh, but we don't want, we didn't want the course to be about us. We wanted the course to be about students' experience, student opinions, but also a vast range of opinions and experience from different people that we thought were 
important for students to know about. So we invited many people to come to our class to share what you know what, what they lived through, uh, sh share their uh, understanding of Quebec society, but more generally Canadian society and the whole world. So we had a mix. So that was in 2015. It was an in-class course, and we had a mix of people. We had people like Daniel Salles, scholars. So we had you know, half of, about of our guests who came to our course were scholars. Uh, people like Daniel Salé, who are really specialist experts in their field. And we had academe, uh, like Yolande James, ex-minister, uh, who came to the class to comment on Quebec politics. So we really wanted to make sure that it was not only a strictly academic, scholarly uh, teaching that students would receive, but also something broader, where um, a lot of uh, the, uh, the big issues of Quebec are not only debated, but put into practice. So in 2017, since the course went so well, uh, Concordia approached us and said, would you be interested to transform this in-class course into a, uh, an online course? So make that conversion from in-class to virtual teaching. And we said yes. And we said yes because we knew that we could do two things that we couldn't do in class. So the first is, and that's interesting, it, it's, it's to make the course fully bilingual. Because one of the challenges that we faced when we organized the course the first time when it was in class is that in Quebec society, a lot of what's going on is going on in French. You know, it's interviews in French, uh, public, uh, policies published only in French. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we uh, uh, had this conversation between the, the Francophones and the Anglo people in class, that it could be on state everything. And so the course is, is the first bilingual course ever offered at Concordia, uh, probably the first ever offered uh, in Quebec. I'm not sure about that, but I think it's at least one of the first. And, um, and everything is translated. And so students can go back and forth between French and English, English and French, as they move on uh, the, the, the semester. Uh, and uh, for them, it's really interesting because Francophones who feel at some point in the semester that they would be more comfortable answering some questions in French can switch back to common, common uh, of French or who want to show uh, their future employers that even though they studied at Concordia, they, you know, they, they, they took a course in French, uh, can do so. The second thing that we could do that we couldn't do uh, in a regular in-class course was increase the number of our guest speakers. In a normal, regular in-class course, you can invite one person, maybe two people every week. And in an uh, online course, the sky's the limit. You can invite pretty much as many people as you want. And so for us, it was a great opportunity to increase students' exposure to even a broader uh, range of opinions and I so this is the template of the online course uh, it is every week is the same as you will see so we want to have diversity in the opinions and ideas that were presented to have a structure and I think that's really important for an online course a structure which, which would be repeated every week so students would be not, not be lost in a, a maze of, uh, of options so you've got home is, is the introduction, getting started is the syllabus, uh, then you've got the 12 lessons, the assessments, the agenda, the contacts, that is the professor and the TAs, and the biographies, that is the biographies of those who accepted to give interviews for the online course. So this is what the lessons look like. So there are 12. Uh, the first uh, uh, the first two lessons are on the history of Quebec, probably because, you know, Jack has a PhD in history. I've, although I'm a sociologist, I work closely with um, historians. So uh, we wanted to have these two first two lectures establish the foundation of the history of Quebec. So it's focused on French uh, 
from New France to 1960 and then from the Quiet Revolution to now. The third lesson is on nationalism. The fourth on the changing markers of identity. The fifth on immigration, race and ethnicity. The sixth on indigenous peoples. Uh, seventh on the economy and the state. Eighth government and governance. Uh, then social mobilization. And the 10th is on Montreal. The 11th on sports, lifestyle and landmarks. And the final one on the arts. So when they open a lesson, when, they, when students uh, see what the uh, what the uh, are offered is always this this uh, this template. So there's always an introduction. So a word from your professors that is Jack and I that will be discussed that particular week. Then there are always four videos with our different guest speakers. Each video is accompanied by a digging deeper section. So there are always four digging deeper sections. I will say what about that in a minute. Then there is a weekly assignment. And then there is a things to know section, which is really important because in the interviews, people don't always cover everything that needs to be said. You know, there are things that are missing or there are important points that are not there for different reasons, lack of time or whatever. whatever. Um, and so we added a things to know section where everything that we believe are important for students to retain for the final exam is included. So this is what uh, Jack and I call our wall of fame, <laughs> a wall of fame sort of. So we have 23 different people who came and accepted to be interviewed. Uh, and their interviews uh, sometimes are divided in one, two or three parts, depending. Some people may address only nationalism, others may address uh, Montreal and ethnicity. It depends on who we are interviewing. But as you can see, it's pretty much well divided between scholars on the one hand and people from outside academe on the other hand. Uh, uh, you know, the, the time, uh, uh, this, the clock didn't stop ticking uh, in 2017 when we realized these interviews and therefore there were changes that were made between then and now and this is something that we need to consider that we need to be aware about that life goes on for for the different people an example of that is Catherine Dorian we didn't want to invite people who were politicians that was a rule that Jack and I set for ourselves at the beginning and uh, we didn't expect that Catherine Dorion, in the meantime, since 2017, would be elected MNA. So these are things that you know you need to consider when organizing a, a, an online course. Uh, the people that we interviewed are people that we thought would bring something different to the conversation. So it's like an added flavor, kind of, to what students might already know. In some cases, uh, a good an example of that that I, I really. Uh, is Andrew Molson. So we we thought about, Jack and I thought about inviting someone to talk about the place of French and so just to talk about what speaking French for a majority of people in the province of Quebec, what does it mean for Quebec, for Canada, and uh, more broadly. And so we decided to uh, invite Andrew Molson because we knew he was a student at Laval University when he was young. He made that decision. He wanted to study in French. So talk to us about your experience and what it means to be a businessman in Montreal and have this dual duality, you know, this, this French and English divide. So, so people that we invited were always uh, either full experts who had a, a very made it more possible for students to engage with what they had to say. We have weekly assignments. So in total, we have 10 assignments, almost one for every week, except the first two weeks, worth 7% each for a total of 70%. And these 10 assignments are made to maximize online teaching. All right. So for example, one of the assignments that we design uh, is students are asked to watch 15 music videos and it's important not only to listen to the songs, but listen or watch the videos because the videos were chosen because they have also something to say. One example is uh, this clip. Uh, it's a song by Robert Charlebois, uh, Ordinaire. 
And it's taken from the movie Gabriel, which is a Canadian drama film directed by Louise Archambault in 2013. And the film stars a young woman, Gabrielle Marion Rivard, who has Williams syndrome and who participates in a choir of development, development, development developmentally, yes, disabled adults. And the film won two Canadian Screen Awards, including Best. With this clip, students are uh, exposed to a beautiful song written by Charlebois, but also they discover a magnificent Canadian film. And also, and also it's extremely moving. It's a very uh, uh, moving, uh, uh, it brings almost tears to your eyes when you listen to that, to that music video so they are students learn how you know a simple quebecois song can have a more universal appeal the digging deeper section is an occasion for students to go deeper into a particular topic uh, so uh, once they have listened to the 15 minute to 20 minute interview uh, they can they can opt to go deeper now this is not compulsory, all right? St students don't need to do that. It's not part of the final exam, but if they wish to do it, they can go deeper and, and, and discover different things that are made to be more fun because of course, because it's not compulsory. Uh, we thought that it would be important to design these digging deeper sections of things that students can do and would be, uh, would want to do would be tempted to do because there is a ludic dimension. Uh, and the best example is the time machine. Uh, it's a VR experience. It's the first VR experience made by Concordia University. It was in collaboration with Ubisoft and students are asked to visit the Faubourg Ablas. Now the Faubourg Ablas no longer exists. It was torn down in 1963 by the city of Montreal. It was considered a slum. So 5,000 people were evicted and had to find a new home. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredible story. And you cannot, of course, visit the Faubourg Amnas today because it's, it, it's basically it's a giant parking lot. And so we designed this VR experience where students can actually press either start or commencer because it's fully bilingual. So if they press start, what they will uh, visit is an apartment, which is reproduced from the pictures taken just before the destruction. And it's like a typical 1963, like J January 1963 uh, uh, apartment. And there, of course, it's VR. So inside the apartment, they can actually read uh, an issue of La Patrie, an actual 1963 issue of La Patrie with FLQ printed on it. Um, they can uh, look at the catalog by Dupuis Frère, which is the equivalent of the Eaton catalog. Into the radio, they can look through the window, they can uh, watch television, and they will see programs from that particular year. So it's a digging deeper, it's optional, but students. Uh, 99.9% of the students want to do it because it's so it's so uh, it's so interesting and so and so fun for them to do so. So um, I'm almost finished. I, I want to talk about the upsides and the downsides of of the online course. Uh, the first up bilingual and in Quebec I think this is really important because the richness of Quebec can you can only get it if you embrace the totality of French and English languages there is so much published and done in French in Quebec that would not be accessible otherwise to an English only speaker uh, the other advantage is that you can invite many and oftentimes extremely busy guests so you have 23 people you know, who are there, who would probably not be able to fit in their agenda to come on a particular week at Concordia. But since it's filmed beforehand, uh, and you, you say, well, any time in that month, we can uh, actually uh, set up a meeting and do the interview, it's easier for people to say yes and accept to participate. 
and so we have people like Sherry Simon. That's it's a picture of Sherry Simon that you see here, an international scholar. She's incredible, and uh, and being able to have her in the online course is just amazing for for students. And the third thing is that it makes for a very dynamic learning environment. Uh, every week there's something happening like it's uh, and students really appreciate that they, they tell us you know they send us uh, emails uh, saying how they appreciate that every week there's something special going on uh, uh, amazing interviews but the digging deeper sections as well the, uh, the assignments also that are designed to be engaging and compelling so for students it's every week they know that it's going it's going to be loaded in a way that it, that is not uh, burdensome for them the downside uh, basically it's uh, the, the time that it that is required to set up such a course it is so time consuming you spend so much time working on it it's like uh, i didn't know like <laughs> if somebody would come to me and say uh, jean philippe i would like to do the same thing what's the first advice uh, that you give me and i would give that person the advice uh, be prepared to spend a lot of time on 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 uh, on the organizing of the course because it's so different from an arm from a normal regular in class course and the second thing that i didn't expect i should have expected but i didn't because I'm, i was pretty naive is that it's really rigid like once the train left the station it's there's almost no going back and we had the first year in particular, many technical glitches, all right? So not so much thing that, that were, that did, that go, went wrong because of the teaching itself, but because of the technology that the, the discussion board was a mess. Um, and so the, and, and we could not adapt rapidly enough to integrate the changes as we went, uh, as we moved uh, uh, along the semester. And therefore, we had to say to students, unfortunately, well, this this year, this will not work, or this won't happen, or this, you know, we'll, we'll adapt that uh, for the time being this way. And But we could only make the big changes the following year. It was really frustrating because in a regular course, you know, you can change your syllabus, you can change uh, your assignment, you can change whatever on the spot. And uh, this doesn't happen on, in an online course. So basically, uh, Jack and I, I think our experience is extremely positive. I think students' experience also from the feedbacks that we receive is extremely positive. Uh, uh, I think it's something that uh, enables you to do something different. I think this is the purpose of an online course is not to reproduce a regular in-class course and to do something different. And definitely we could offer students a different menu from what they are normally served in uh, in academe that's it thank you thanks john philippe we'll uh, pass it over now to jack okay hi everyone so uh thanks very much for that john philippe and uh you know it's almost as though there was something prophetic about our uh, planning this course uh, five years ago because who would have thought five years later that this many people would end up studying online so you know going back at that time i recall one of the conversations i had with jean philippe was uh along the lines of if i had the opportunity of hearing from sigmund freud like directly right to uh, video lecture as opposed to hearing me or someone else interpreting the interpretation of what Sigmund Freud was trying to tell us at that particular time, which very often is what, you know, we hear from a lot of our expertise. And I think what this platform offers is the ability to get both, right? You can actually hear from someone who, you know, uh, has presented uh, their views, the original views online, and then hear the interpretation of others subsequently. And in that regard, I would say that uh, Kevin, hearing from Kevin Tierney, recording Kevin Tierney, Right, who was one of the invited speakers in our platform, uh, who's since passed away, was invaluable because you know the opportunity to hear from him, uh, who's produced some major Quebec films and notably uh, Good Cop, uh, Bon Cop, Bad Cop, or Good Cop, Bon Cop, whatever, uh, uh, was really, really critical because now we can both hear from him and get the interpretation going forward from other experts. So 
I think that's one of the, on the upside, that's one of the unique and really invaluable upsides of, of doing this. Um, so uh, I know we're a little pressed for time. So I am going to present uh, uh, something online about uh, our initiative, uh, the one we at least are pursuing currently. I'll try to do that really quickly. Uh, and so uh, away we go. So we're actually involved right now uh, and inspired by uh, this uh, initial development of the course with Jean-Philippe of creating our own platform by looking at our own resources uh, and our own networks and seeing if we can construct a series of courses with modules uh, that are in line with two of our mandates. So right now we have two things that are running sort of parallel, but will ultimately be connected. One is U Metropolis, which is very much focused on putting online a lot of the resources that we've uh, developed over the years uh, on the issues of immigration, integration, and settlement. And we polled our uh, metropolis constituents right, to see if they would be interested in taking online professional development targeted to the metropolis network. And you can see that 95% of our network uh, would be interested in taking online professional development through Metropolis. And I'll explain momentarily what our strategy is in that regard, because our idea, well, I'll explain right now for you, Metropolis, is not for us to develop the courses. We'll develop some of the courses, but it's actually to have the courses developed by the organizations with whom we're partners. So it's a practitioner-driven uh, set of courses. So we would enlist a partner organization um, that has decades of experience as an example in, immigrate, in, 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 in welcoming newcomers to create the course based on guidelines we offer them. Uh, and in that way, they'll be part of our umbrella of partners that would also feel uh, a, a reason uh, to promote within their network the uh, you know, taking or selection of that particular learning module or course. So it would create multiple partnerships as regards the creation of U Metropolis. But on the other end, you can study which is the sort of, I appreciate that sounds a bit cheesy, right? The you can study, but uh, it's uh, the name we're currently operating with. I happen to like it, but that, you know, that doesn't mean, well, it probably does mean that's the name we'll use, but you know, it, it, you know, it's not, that's not essential. Like we could have a, other ideas. Uh, before I get into quickly into you can study and what the rationale behind it is, which is arising from our non, you know, the work we're doing on with Canadian Heritage have done over 20 years. Uh, let me just share, because I can't help but doing this, some data with you that is from our most recent survey, right? uh, the survey done October 16th, October 18th. And so that basically says, since the beginning of the pandemic, would you say the relations have worsened between these groups, right? Indigenous and non-Indigenous, French and English, Chinese and other Canadians, Black and other Canadians, Muslim and non-Muslim, Jewish and non-Jewish. And then I create this sort of index of intercultural relations based on those six bilateral relationships as regards the perceptions. So you could see that this one, Chinese and non-Chinese, at this particular moment in our sort of uh, evolution is uh, the one that ranks the highest in terms of the perception that relations are worse, right? And then you can see that, you know, it's uh, indigenous, non-indigenous is an area of high concern in terms of relations being worse and black and other Canadians uh, being another area of uh, high concern, uh, lower concerns around language issues, lower concerns around uh, faith-based relations. Those things are always in flux, of course, right? Things can change. They're very incident oriented. You know, we've gone through a challenging period this uh, over the pandemic in terms of relationships with, uh, uh, you know, issues around the Black Lives Matters and, and some indigenous uh, issues, very legitimate concerns expressed there. Uh, and here are just differences along the lines of Isminoids versus the white respondents and how they see some of these relations. The reason I'm uh, raising that is because uh, I believe that the history component of this, of knowing the historical background around some of those relationships, around the communities uh, that have been uh, formed over time and that have evolved, uh, as a contributing factor in understanding the dynamics of the relations and the ability to address them for educators, for young people, is an actually uh, actual potential critical area uh, for learning uh, and uh, is, is, is sort of uh, building, helping to build a vision behind uh, you can study. Okay. So uh, hang on one second, everybody. I got to take a one second uh, break. So, sorry, there was a little background noise I had to deal with. So just done that. Um, so now to go back. Uh, 
So the idea behind the uh, UCAN study would be to offer e-learning for those interested in enhancing teaching skills and knowledge about identity formation and the history of communities that help shape contemporary Canada. Right? Uh, it will aim to expand our knowledge about the origins of Canada by focusing on the evolution of Indigenous, French, British, and many linguistic, ethnic, and racialized communities that have contributed to shaping the country's identities. Uh, it'll provide a unique multidisciplinary approach to the history of identity formation uh, via the presentation of learning modules, drawing upon the knowledge and expertise of genealogists, researchers, archivists, educators, uh, and various others as well, just to name a few. Um, and the ultimate objective is for learners to build greater cross-sectoral insight into and perspectives with a focus on history and contemporary challenges in the pres preservation and promotion of identities. Uh, so, uh, right. Right, so it's built a bit around at the origins, uh, going back to the origins of our organization, right, which was inspired by Tom Simon's report. Few of you will, will know this, some may, uh, to know ourselves and how important it was 50 years ago uh, that we learn more about ourselves as a community, as communities, as nations, as uh, persons with varying identities and mixed identities, and how the history of that particular uh, identity and identities in flux and formation have affected our contemporary view on issues and our capacity to address them. So in other words, what you might describe it as is uh, rooting the issues of diversity training or intercultural competence, as we sometimes describe them, in knowledge of our history. Right? I've often wondered when I hear, you know, the uh, diversity when I when I've had the opportunity to engage with uh, practitioners in diversity training or offering intercultural competence, who very often talk about contemporary issues or demographic uh, realities where the history piece is, because the history piece isn't always there. And I, I wonder, uh, you know, uh, sometimes without knowing the history of particular communities, uh, how we can effectively engage and deliberate around some of these issues, right? Uh, if we only stay, in other words, with the sort of current contemporary cultural expressions of those communities as and extract that from their history and background, uh, whether we're doing justice to offering the learner uh, a full and rich knowledge of you know, what underpins or what underlies some of these uh, critical issues and the challenges that they raise for building uh, cohesion and for living together. I'm not, I'm not always been a fan of the idea of vivre ensemble or living together. I sometimes find it used in ways that's a bit too fluid and not you know, concrete enough. Uh, but the pandemic has made me think that uh, actually that paradigm of living together uh, has its merits uh, as long as we're rigorous about you know what it actually means and not simply you know make make it a, a buzz phrase. Um, so uh, going back to possible courses, right? Uh, migration history will probably be a starting point for any organization like our own that does a lot of work in the area of immigration and migration. And one of our first learning modules that we're currently about to embark on will be around the Métis in Canada, uh, uh, where uh, what we're going to do is root the course content in uh, our publications, because we have a forthcoming publication on the history of the Métis and current challenges. So we take our contributors from the uh, publication, the 10 of them, and they would be our thought leaders in the same way that when Jean-Philippe and I, you know, put together that course, we identified a group of thought leaders. So we do the same thing, and, and the publication would be a key learning tool for us in supporting the sort of uh, deeper dive, if you like, or deeper dig in the way that we've phrased it, Jean-Philippe has it in the course, uh, into learning about the Métis and their history. Uh, a second module or learner course with modules would be on ancestry. Uh, and we have a new publication, which I'd invite some of you to consult if you're interested, called The Personal Past, History, Identity, and, Ge and the Genealogical Impulse, which will make the history a bit more personal because you know, I felt for a while that in terms of teaching history, we don't make it personal enough for the learner. Uh, and so there's a relationship we built between tracing one's own history, background and ancestry or ancestries and connecting that to interest in our history uh, uh, in terms of the identities and how they've evolved in the country and in terms of the formation of such identities and the construction of communities. Uh, and there you can see some of the other themes that we'll be thinking about. And we also want to hear from in the case of uh, history of immigration, the immigrants themselves. So that would also be part of this process as regards 
the learning dimension courses and modules for you can study, right? So you could see a variety of topics we're pondering for the sort of first modules that we and courses that we'll generate over the next 12 to 18 months. Right? So that's the way it looks uh, at this particular time. Um, stop share. Uh, here, by the way, is the publication that I was referring to, right? Uh, this one, and when we flip it around here, right? Oops, not upside down. It's uh, nice and bilingual. So um, also, I think what we all want to do eventually when we, and I'll say this, I know time is uh, running short, is uh, we want to create learning circles inside our courses so that people can get together and discuss some of the issues inside the, inside the course. Uh, and and I, I think in terms of what Jean-Philippe and I did, you know, uh, it, it is bilingual, right? Uh, it is, but bilingual in this case means streams of English and French. Uh, the, the potential beauty of that type of course going forward, especially in this situation, one I hope we get out of relatively soon, uh, is that people can engage virtually. And students are doing that, I see in my daughter's courses, right? They've created their circles and so forth that, and, and, uh, and can engage across language in this case uh, in order to share insights, experiences, and, 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 and that to me would be a key component going forward in helping build on uh, the learning experience provided online. So I'll stop there. Uh, I know I've gone over time as well, and I apologize for that. But you know, uh, I, I hope that you know I've been able to at least give people a good glimpse of what our expectation or hope is. And and Chris, who's moderating, is the person we've got driving this, right, Chris? So Indeed. I pass back to you, and you'll pass to Rachel. Indeed. Uh, thanks a lot, Jack. And uh, Rachel, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Jack. Uh, so interesting to hear uh, what you guys are up to. I'm going to just uh, start sharing my screen. Uh, hold up. Okay. Whoop. I just want to make that small. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so just uh, let me know if that's, uh, that's working out okay. Um, no, nope, just moving things over. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, so I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in terms of the the K to twelve classroom and particularly in secondary uh, schools um, and share some practical examples uh, of things that I've uh, been involved in uh, and and uh, helped with. So I'm just going to get my chat up so I can see. Oh. Okay, I'll stop and re restart. Thanks. Ugh. Okay. Ugh. Too many screens. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, one more time. Perfect. This is what we wanted. Okay, we're all good now. Uh, okay, so some practical examples. So if you're a secondary teacher uh, and uh, you want to follow along, I've put some links into the slide deck to link right to resources. So uh, you can go right to that bit.ly um, to get the slides and I'll tweet that out after as well. So uh, one of the things that, that I've been involved in is uh, writing a number of resources. So some of the textbooks that are, that are written are shown here, as well as developing uh, resources with Elections Canada for secondary schools. And through the process of consultation and engagement with teachers um, all over Canada, um, we've, we've found that teachers want resources that are um, fit all of these criteria, regardless of whether they're online or, or not. Um, so whatever needs to be, whatever is developed for secondary schools needs to be curriculum linked because teachers are driven. We can't just decide what we're going to cover. We have to, I mean, we have some choices, but we have to teach the curriculum, uh, whatever that looks like in our province or territory. Um, what teachers really want is things that are inquiry based so that they have essential or driving questions. They're classroom tested. So it's not just, you know, something that an academic thought of um, and um, we uh, they we want we need things that are modular and flexible. So I really appreciate uh, Jean Philippe what you were saying about uh, how it gets really rigid, right? Like once you put all the things in there, um, but you know teachers need to redesign things to suit their classroom and their students. And so every, the more modular, the better. Um, and we really want rich content. So like in the case of history, that's like primary source, uh, you know, documents and data. 
and that they have rich pedagogy within it. So it's not just uh, lecturing and, and, and memorizing and testing, like we really want to reflect the current pedagogical environment. Uh, and of course, in a history class, we want to use and teach historical thinking concepts. And <laughs> we need things to be accessible for our students. So students can't read primary sources that are way above their reading level. Um, they need things that they can access so that they can engage with the history and, and you know, learn to be those good citizens that uh, that Jean Augustine was talking about earlier today. Um, so online resources should also um, use learning objects and other interactive tools to inspire discussion and thinking. So uh, I love the videos that you've got in your course, Jean-Philippe. Like, I think that's really, you know, the kind of thing that we're looking for. Uh, visually engaging, so not just a bunch of text, but also use less text than traditional resources. We know that when, when people are reading things online, like they need things to be in bullet points, they need lots more white space. Um, we don't have as much stamina for doing things online as we do in, in print or in person. Um, they have to be usable on a variety of platforms. So you can't build something that's just like only available on iPad because your school doesn't have iPad or maybe your school only has iPads and doesn't have Google. Like it needs to be uh, flexible if you want a lot of reach. Uh, and then mindful of online safety for teachers and students. So making sure that, that the community is, is closed and, um, and safe and, and all of those things are met. So I'm going to share some practical examples. So uh, these are two courses that I worked on as a co-author uh, and lead reviewer for the Ontario e-learning system. So we've got these uh, Canadian history uh, 1914 to the present. That's our grade 10 mandatory course in Ontario. And then uh, CHY4U, which is world history since the 15th century. So these are just sort of the, the way they kind of look in the uh, in the online learning platform that we have. So I just want to highlight a couple of neat things that we were able to do um, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these courses. Um, and Diane Vautour, who's here today, I'm not sure if she's in this session, uh, she was the lead author on, on this uh, Canadian history course. Um, and so this is fantastic, a great thing that we've got embedded in our courses. Um, so it's really this, uh, you know, you've got a an, an collection of primary source documents, and they're around a big question. Uh, and so when you click on the, so this is the, the cover page here. And then when you click on them, uh, you can see this image and it's got like these information texts that pop up. So the information is not just in one long, you know, sort of book format or one long scroll. It's all integrated into this really visual format. Um, and uh, here's another image uh, from the Africville uh, learning object. Uh, and uh, so one of the things, so not only do we need the content, like teachers um, really need to some, the support with the kind of worksheets and, and thinking tools. Um, so this is one that, that we pulled from uh, the Visible Thinking Resource Guide, uh, but really just these worksheets to really like help students um, engage in that kind of critical thinking uh, that they that they will need as the building blocks before they they move along in their lives and to think about things as as citizens. Um, so here's another example from that course. Uh, so this one is actually taken. Uh, the idea for this um, learning object was taken from the historical thinking um, templates. So this is a causation diagram where you you have uh, all of these different sort of primary sources. So you've got some images and some a little bit of text and then students take these uh, take these in the diagram itself and move them around to show um, how how important how more or less important they were and to kind of sort them into some basic sort of historical uh, categories. Uh, so, so this is a really great way that you can uh, integrate this kind of thinking into the learning object without just presenting a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of uh, content. So this is an example from the uh, grade 12 course. So this is a world history course. Uh, and so this is really looking at that idea of, um, you know, significant figures. So, and, and, you know, did the person shape the times? Were they a product of the times? Uh, and, and that kind of question, what kind of agency did they have in their time? Uh, and so, whoops, this is, uh, this is really great for um, not only these online conversations where you're going to join that discussion and in that message board, um, but you're also, it can also inspire conversations in the classroom too. 
Uh, one, one other just fun learning object uh, or interactive tool that promotes thinking. So this is from our, our uh, the, the 20th century unit in this grade 12 course. Uh, and so each of these topics here, uh, they have like a, a, a bunch of content that's with it. And then once students have read that, then they, you know, kind of move, move these uh, boxes one way or the other uh, to show where they think, you know, that was this decline or progress, and then they can enter into discussions and, and, and justify their reasoning. Uh, this is an example of a blended learning tool. So for those of you who are, you know, like, everybody's doing blended learning now because we're doing online and, and in class at the same time. Uh, so this is a blended learning tool that we did in a, a civics class with a group of uh, teachers in my board uh, through the Ontario Teachers Federation. Uh, we had some funding to do this. Uh, and so what we ended up doing was having uh, different kinds of technology, both in the classroom. I think we were doing all the technology was in the classroom, which we found really supported students uh, in learning. Uh, and then we had all these different kinds of things to help students understand what a civic issue is. Um, because so many students, every student has to take this civics course. Uh, many of them are language learners. Many of them don't understand these concepts. I mean, they're only 15. Um, and so it was it was worthwhile to spend time to look at uh, how do we how do we get to this key question of the course? What's a civic issue that I care about and give them a lot of um, a lot of support to do that. Uh, and this final example that I'm showing you now is from my work uh, with Elections Canada. So, uh, so again, uh, so we built these uh, resources to be um, in person. So this, in, in your classroom, you would get a giant mat and some cards and, and play with it. And with the, with the pandemic and, and school moving online, um, you know, and even as we're back in school in many places, you know, we're not doing group work anymore. Uh, we felt it was really important to provide tools for teachers so that they could still engage in this, the students could still engage in this kind of thinking uh, and, and uh, working together on something. So this is actually this, what you're looking at right now, this is a second step of the case study. So the first step is to, uh, you get a Google form and you look, you read through um, the, uh, the information on the cards and then you uh, and then you say like whether you think this event was more inclusion or more exclusion. Uh, and then you can move into this uh, Google Draw where you can move the cards around. Uh, and uh, those are all available uh, at electionsanddemocracy.ca. So in the blended learning tools. Uh, one more example. Chris, let me know how I'm doing for time. Uh, so. Uh, so this is an, a, a really cool thing that I had nothing to do with. Um, I just, you know, uh, wanted to share uh, the way the way it works. So this is a uh, force to fight by the Canadian Red Cross on in, in international humanitarian law. And uh, so you go through this, um, these stories as a as a, a, a person as usually a child or a young person in a conflict zone. And you have to um, make these kinds of choices. So you get these real choices of, of real people. And then all of this uh, is where the students, uh, students can pick and then their outcome is different depending on which path they choose. Uh, and then they've also included uh, really rich background information for teachers as well. So Hey, perfect timing. So uh, you can find me on Twitter. I've been tweeting all day um, at our Collishaw. And uh, like I said, if you're looking for uh, links, I've put links uh, to these resources within the slide deck. So you can go to the slide deck and find out. Thanks so much, Rachel. What an interesting presentation that was. <laughs> so we have some questions to go through. So I have a first question here for Jean-Philippe. Um, is the uh, the Faubourg uh, MLS uh, VR link available to the public and for use in the classroom? So the, uh, well, there is no actual classroom. So for this particular course, but we wanted uh, to be able to offer uh, every student at Concordia the chance to come to what we call the fourth space. It's a special location at Concordia to come there and be able to do the experiment uh, there with the proper equipment. The reason why at first we were not too um, 
too to keen on offering the course at large uh, or the experience, the VR experience at large, is that uh, you really require a very high tech technology to have the full experience. If you do that on, you know, some people have uh, uh, cardboards and a, and a cell phone and they, they kind of design their own mask. Uh, it, it, you, of course, it, it will work to some extent, but it, it doesn't give you really the feeling of what it means to do that particular experience. So the first year, uh, the idea was no, we, we want to, we, it will be at the, uh, the library and at different locations where students can rent the equipment and at the fourth space where it will be uh, accessible for them. The problem is there's the pandemic. <laughs> and so uh, what we decided, it was unfortunate, but the, 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 the breaking, you know, the heartbreaking decision that we made is that we filmed the experience this semester and students can only see the video. They, can, they cannot even do the experiment at home. This will change next year, uh, but uh, but it was uh, it was an unfortunate decision that we had to make for this year. So in this year, they can only see the video and nothing else. And uh, a question from me, uh, Jean-Philippe, do you plan at Concordia to, to do another experience like this, another VR experience? Uh, absolutely, this is the pilot. Uh, it, it, it's, it's really incredible. I've, I've done it, you know, with the, the proper equipment. It's, it's just fantastic. It's something, what we wanted, the first, um, the first criterion, uh, criterion, do something that students could not do otherwise. So, and so we thought, well, this is something that nobody can do because it no longer exists. So it's the only way for like a person like me who's passionate about the history of, of Canada to, uh, to actually visit the, uh, the Faubourg Hamlas. So we want to do more of that. Uh, we got to find the right people, the right, uh, the right opportunity, well knowing the cost of doing something like that because we had the help of Ubisoft. It was a partnership with them, but it still cost about $100,000 for this first pilot. Of course, you know, the next editions will be cheaper, but it, you got to understand that I was talking about it, the fact that it's time consuming, organizing an online course. It can also mean a, a, a big investment for, for universities. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, we have... Let me jump in on that quickly. Yeah, also. go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. So, uh, I mean, I think, think it is time consuming, but I would say this, the part of the time consuming... Very busy with, you know, uh, multiple other things. So I think the time it took could be reduced if you're sort of doing this in a dedicated way, right? Full time, right? So... Yeah, uh, I, will, I would, I would uh, also see this. Thought I have about I would, that. I would the other issue is that... You know, I think Jack has some connection issues. Ed, do you want to take it away, Jean-Philippe? You have oh, yeah, I, want, I wanted just to say, I want to say if I had seen and heard Rachel's presentation before I, I ventured into organizing an online course, I would have been much better prepared. I, yeah, I totally could have sent it to you ahead of time, Jean-Philippe. No, no <laughs> the other thing I did want to just jump in with just quickly is uh, that I like about our initiative is that if you're in another country, because ideally, I mem remember mentioning this to Jean-Philippe, if you're in Australia and you want to take this excellent course to you know, improve your knowledge about Quebec, right? Uh, unless you're a student of Concordia University, you won't be able to access the, access the course, right? So uh, ideally, if you know, I'm hoping in our platform or other platforms, we can make the content accessible to someone anywhere in the world right, who wants to do this. Because frankly, if you've taken some of those Quebec studies courses in Australia, I mean, I know the person who's a specialist, you know, they're just not as good as the as the real thing. They ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing I wanted to say, Jean Philippe. Like, man, I really want to take your course. Like, it sounds amazing. <laughs> it it ain't nothing like the real thing. That's any whatever. Take the mic. No karaoke Go today. We'll save it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, a uh, question for you, Jack. Um, what was the name of the publications, and uh, where could we purchase? These? Okay, so the publication, this one. Right, is the one you're referring to, I guess? Right, that one? I so it's so. available on our website at www.acs-ac.ca and it's uh, free of cost, actually. So uh, so very inexpensive, much less than the course, the cost to do the course that Jean-Philippe was uh, you know, listing the price. I actually thought it was a lot more, Jean-Philippe. They told me a higher number. So I'm glad to see it was lower than what you said. 
Uh, another question, I guess, uh, Jack, that you and I can probably answer together. Um, uh, do you think that these courses uh, will be available for uh, secondary history teachers to use as they look like they could be very useful? So do you want to add anything to that and I can, I can help out with that question? You uh, you okay there, Jack? Can you uh, do I'm you not frozen for a bit. I don't, I don't know why I keep getting frozen. I'm not that cold, but the, you know, <laughs> but uh, so you have to repeat the question. Yeah, so um, the uh, modules you talked about, will they be available for secondary history teachers to use? Because uh, they look like they'd be useful. Yeah, so if you want to add something. Exactly is to make them available for uh, target educators and particularly history and social studies teachers as well, right? More broadly, because I think as yeah. I said, the history pieces are just for people with interest in history. We're trying to ensure that the history component is connected to some of the contemporary challenges that are being faced in addressing the issues. Right. So it's not history extracted from, you know, the contemporary reality. You know, it's that personally, that's not the type of history that, you know, I, I, well, uh, let me let me rephrase that. Uh, I'm trying to determine how best the, the, that knowledge of history can be applied to contemporary situations. Yeah. I, thanks, Jack. I think that is the really key thing that teachers are looking for is like, how is this like, how can I help my students unpack this issue? in my classroom and the more resources we have to do that like in my classroom in the world like whatever um the more resources we have to do that the, the better yeah and let me also just uh, interject quickly i was saying that i didn't i was about to say i don't like history that doesn't isn't connected to contemporary realities i mean anyone knows me knows that that's not true i have lots of memorabilia <laughs> you know i can start the screen from it for you if necessary I love that stuff you know and so but and for purposes of you know of of the so connecting to the sociology Right. I think it's very important to make this as contemporary relevant as possible. So and that's why I also feel that personal connections are very important as well. Make history meaningful to people personally to make it meaningful more generally. And if I can add just a small thing, uh, which is that um, the content will be available to uh, teachers if there is interest there from the teachers. So uh, we did uh, put out a survey earlier today, um, which is to help us gauge the interest uh, on this kind of thing with the teachers. So if you are interested, make sure to uh, look at that survey. Um, we have uh, another question, uh, again, for Jack, you and I, I guess. Um, how do teachers access the courses in U Metropolis you can study once they are available? And uh, Jack, I'll take that one if that's okay with you. So uh, the, the courses will be, um, uh, at this point, we think available online, just uh, on an online platform, uh, which you can uh, anybody can get to who has an internet connection. Um, how they are actually available once we get there is still something we are, are working on, um, but it will be something hopefully that's, that's available to uh, a range of people. Uh, and I think that's all for our question. So I guess, uh, Rachel, Jack, uh, Jean-Philippe, do you have anything else you'd like to add and any comments about what we've discussed today? Yeah. Jean-Philippe, like if I get this thing up to like a really high level with all the courses necessary, uh, for our virtual campus, if I'm looking for rector, is it a position you'd consider at some point? In the future? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it privately. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're like a virtual rector, you know, you're not a, you're not to be, you're not to be in the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I just wanted to pick up on something that, uh, that Jean-Philippe said earlier in his presentation about time. Um, and uh, I know every every teacher out there is, is feeling it. Um, secondary, post-secondary, doesn't matter. I mean, kindergarten teachers are feeling it. Like doing things online yeah. requires so much more of your time um, to get things ready, to, to troubleshoot, to, um, to, to be with students as best as you can. So I think, uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Thanks. <laughs> in, in terms of time, do you think that's a, um, like an upfront time uh, investment or is it, it as you kind of have built the course and then maintaining the course is that also something that takes so time? I think it's it's both upfront and um, and ongoing so even yeah. so those courses that I was talking about I mean those are pre-built for teachers to use but they have to choose which parts they're going to use or not with their students and then they have to like read the discussions that the students are the discussion posts that the students are are having and like make sure to moderate things and and answer emails so there's like I think even even if the upfront costs are borne by somebody else um, there's the ongoing time costs are huge for teachers okay. 
um, yeah. And what would you say the would you say the kind of discussion boards are one of the biggest areas that, that takes time for? The, I do I do think that, and so so a lot of the ways that I've been trying to think about is like how do we how do we move the 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 work from the teacher to the student. So how can we make students more responsible for their own learning and kind of get out of the way a little bit more, uh, let them have discussions where you pop in occasionally, but you're not marking everything. I think that's what secondary teachers are struggling with right now. They're trying to like assess everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in a regular classroom, you're walking around the room, you're seeing what students are doing, like you're not assessing that like you're not giving a grade to that so um so i think there you know it's it, there's there's a learning curve and there's learning about how to navigate that different environment and if i may just uh one more question for you can you give us an example of one of these solutions where you shifted the uh the kind of the onus to the students from the teachers is that in terms of like a, a um a, how would you say it like a prefect system where you have advanced students helping less advanced students or um, maybe I see where it too. I don't know if we're going to get cut off. I think, <laughs> um, we're okay. I think my, we'll my favorite, okay. uh, my favorite solution actually comes from my daughter who's at post-secondary. She's at uh, art school in Alberta and she, uh, one of her teachers, um, does sort of a 10 minute intro and then he puts everybody into breakout rooms where they are doing critiques of each other's work. And then he pulls the students out one by one and gives them individual critiques over the class time. And then at the end, he does a boxing lesson just for fun, okay. you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think, you know, having like, she's finding that the, the critique that she's giving to other students and, and that other students are giving to her is super valuable. And yeah. he's making time to check in with each of them every day. So it's not about, you know, making a great presentation or having like, you know, a million, a million videos is great. Um, but it's also about connecting, right? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So thanks a lot, Rachel. Thank you, Jack. And thank you, Jean-Philippe. Uh, some really interesting um, solutions we saw there. 